Good evening. My name is Julia Melgreen, and I serve as the pastor at First United Methodist Church. Our two churches, First Presbyterian and First United Methodist, have a tradition of sharing a Good Friday service. You know, it's a beautiful thing when churches can work together for the kingdom of God and the well-being of their community. We are glad that our churches are friends in Jesus Christ. It's really good to know the end of a story, right? As Christians, we journey through Lent with great confidence because we know the end of Jesus' life story. Resurrected from the dead and exalted to the right hand of God. God wins, Jesus lives. We know the end of the story. It makes it easier to go through the terror of Good Friday and Jesus' violent crucifixion because we know already that that's not going to be the last word. We can always see Easter on the horizon. We would be wise to remember that the disciples didn't know. They lived through Jesus' final week not knowing that God would triumph. They only knew the heartbreak of Judas' betrayal, the fear of Jesus' arrest, and the agony of watching their friends suffer and die on a criminal's cross. They were afraid for their own lives and drowning in grief. There was no fast forward through the pain of loss. There was no way for them to imagine the new thing God would do. Good Friday was anything but good. It was darkness, evil, and loss, with no end of those emotions in sight. Can you remember a time when the future stretched out before you, unseeable, unknowable, bleak? When you couldn't even see dimly how you might make your way forward? As I ponder this, I think about the many people who have lost life partners and how from one day to the next, every molecule of the ground has shifted under their feet. I think about how we felt a year ago, six months ago, as COVID raged around the world claiming the lives of loved ones, and we could not see how the future would unfold. We lived through long days with worry as our traveling partner. I think about parents who have lost children and the unwelcome grief that moves into their hearts, stubbornly refusing to leave, ever. I think about the victims of gun shootings, the ravages of poverty, the relentlessness of racism, the hopelessness that must grip parents sending children across international borders alone. All situations in which seeing the way forward is so difficult. We are Easter people for sure. We profess the power of God to overcome everything that is broken in the world and we participate in that healing. We believe in new life that rises defiantly to mock death. But the triumph of Easter only makes sense when held in tension with Good Friday. Death and life, that's the whole story. Today is about death, and I'm so glad you have come to this worship service to remember the darkness that lurks in our story. Today is about death, blood and vinegar, swords and thorny crowns at the cross. Today is about death. Weeping women at a tomb, hearts beyond broken. Today is about death. We'll find disciples cowering behind locked doors, unable to imagine their future. You know, our story isn't all rainbows and skittles, open tombs and friendly gardeners. We know that our story holds all that is dark, evil, and frightening at its core, too. We know what it is to stand in utter darkness. We know the world's tendency toward violence. Our hearts have been shattered by loss. On Good Friday, we don't pretend that everything is okay. Only that when we can't find our way, when there is no light, we will still trust in God's goodness. And that's why you're here once again, to name the darkness that took Jesus' life and to name the darkness that shadows our own. And that is the power of the good news we are privileged to proclaim on Easter. All the darkness is overcome. 
and life, and God and Jesus Christ will reign once again. So tonight, let's not rush to the sunshine of Easter too quickly. Let's linger here for a moment in grief and fear, and remember that the power of God shines most brightly in the victory against the backdrop of total darkness. We're glad that you have come to this service. It is a somber service, one that grips our emotions, and it's an important piece of our story. Thank you for coming.
welcome to you, uh, members and friends of First United Methodist Church and First Presbyterian Church here in Champaign, Illinois. It's so good to worship together as one body. And welcome to you also from other churches and other places, wherever you are from and wherever you are. We are glad that we can be together now as we remember the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Pray with me. Almighty God, look with mercy upon your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and to be given over to the hands of sinners and to suffer death on the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Hear the word of the Lord. It was two days before the Passover and the festival of the unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar, a very costly ointment of nard, and she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, Why was the ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii, and the money given to the poor, and they scolded her. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, and you can show show kindness on them whenever you wish, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She anointed my body beforehand before its burial. Truly I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. On the first day of the unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent his two, two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house. The teacher asks, Where is my guest room? where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples sent out, went out and, and went into the city and found everything that he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he came to the twelve. And when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, One of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and say to him one after the other, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. And while they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. 
When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though all become deserters, I will not. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, I will deny, you will deny me three times. But he said vehemently, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little further, he drew himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him there was a crowd of swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elder, elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came up, he went to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted and fled. A certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all of the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. 
For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another, not made with hands. But even on this point, their testimony did not agree. And then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But he was silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. Some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, and to strike him, saying to him, prophesy. The guards also took him over and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, You also were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I do not know or understand what you are talking about. And he went out into the forecourt. The cock crowed. And the servant girl, on seeing him, began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. Then after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to curse, and he swore an oath, I do not know this man you are talking about. At that moment, the cock crowed for the second time. And then Peter remembered that Jesus said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. <laughs> As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. And then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of Jews? For he realized it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again, Then what do you wish me to do with the man that you call king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Why? What evil has he done? 
But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cohort. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him, and they began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. And then they brought Jesus to the place they called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, and he didn't take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right hand and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha, you would destroy the temple and build it in three days. Save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, Let's see another Elijah. Let's see whether Elijah will come and take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was God's son. Hear the solemn reproaches of the cross. O my my people, people, O my my church, 
What more could I have done for you? Answer me. I led you out of slavery into freedom and delivered you through the waters of rebirth, but you have made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy, immortal one, have mercy upon us. Forty years I led you through the desert, feeding you with manna on the way. I saved you from the time of trial and gave you my body, the bread of heaven. But you have made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. I led you on your way in a pillar of cloud and fire, but you led me to the judgment hall of Pilate. I guided you by the light of the Holy Spirit, but you have made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. I planted you as my fairest vineyard, but you brought forth bitter fruit. I made you branches of the vine and never left your side, but you have made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. I poured out saving water from the rock, but you gave me vinegar to drink. I poured out my life and gave you the new covenant in my blood, but you gave a cross to your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. I gave you a royal scepter, but you gave me a crown of thorns. I gave you the kingdom and crowned you with eternal life, but you have made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. I struck down your enemies, but you struck my head with a reed. I gave you my peace, but you draw the sword in my name, and you have made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. I opened the waters to lead you to the promised land, but you opened my side with a spear. I washed your feet as a sign of my love, but you have made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. I lifted you up to the heights, but you lifted me high on the cross. I raised you from death and prepared you for the tree prepared for you the tree of life but you have made a cross for your savior holy god holy and mighty holy immortal one have mercy upon us i grafted you into my people israel but you have made them scapegoats for your own guilt and you have made a cross for your savior holy god holy and mighty holy immortal one have mercy upon us. I was hungry, and you gave me no food. Thirsty, and you gave me no drink. A stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. And you have made a cross for your Savior. O holy, holy God, God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. If we were here inside of this sanctuary, we would leave in silence. We would hold each other's arms and help one another down the stairs into the kindly night. Pause this night wherever you are. Pause and pray for our world. Pause and pray for each other, Presbyterians and Methodists friends and neighbors, husbands and wives, strangers and guests. I'll pray for you. Will you pray for me? On this night, pause. Take a moment to pause. Seeking God's grace. Seeking God's face streaked with tears. Marked with tears. Thanking God for so loving the world. Remember the Christ. Remember the Christ loving this world on the cross, loving this world literally with everything he had, giving everything he had to give. Pause.
this night. That wondrous love redeems this aching world. Amen? That wondrous love redeems this aching world. Pause. Thank God for this unspeakable gift. That love, that love changes everything. As a child rests in its mother's arms, so will I rest in you. As a child rests in its mother's arms, so will I rest in you. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.